long day, I got a lot to say. It feels like I'm carrying a two-ton weight. I go to see a friend. Hello, I'm Monsignor Patrick Winslow. And I am Father Matthew Couth. And we are speaking from the rooftop. A podcast brought to you by Tan Books, in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air. Where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. Makes me Hello, Father Patrick Winslow. Hello. How are you? I'm doing very well. And yourself? I'm fine. Good to get back together again. It's We've been seen too e- long. It we has. We keep rebuking ourselves. We have this. seen each other on many occasions, but never had the chance to actually do any recording. But now that we are recording, we find ourselves in the midst of Advent. We do. A very short one at that. A very short one at that. So you have four Sundays of Advent. And this is the shortest possible Advent season because you go from the fourth Sunday of Advent to Christmas Eve later that day. This is the Advent that passed. I mean, that candle isn't going to be melted at all. <laughs> that fourth candle is brand spanking new. Well, at most pastors not only will dislike, recycle this, them, yeah. dislike this setup for oh, they Christmas, do. but they that do. candle is going to be recycled. Yeah, it's going to be recycled. <laughs> I mean, come on. No one will notice the, you know, the millimeter or centimeter that it burns down for a morning mass. And as it is, right, so priests are going to have to have a truncated Sunday morning schedule. That's right. Because priests are only permitted to offer three masses maximum. The bishop can't even dispense from this norm. Uh, maximum in a, uh, in a day, that is to say, from morning until night. Uh, into a calendar day. So you have the custom here in the U.S. when most people go to Mass on Christmas Eve and we really load up the Christmas Eve Masses. So we have a pretty extensive schedule. Well, you can't really, if you have limited priest resources, have that extensive evening schedule and have a normal Sunday morning schedule. You just can't make the math work. So I think what's going to happen are a lot of priests are going to have fourth Sunday of Advent on Saturday night vigils, maybe have a couple more. Uh, a lot of people want to know if they can get the twofer. No, there are uh, no twofers. There are. The people will want to know, can I go? I was hey, going to bring Sunday, this up. Sunday evening. This is not a way to celebrate Christmas your king's Eve coming. and fourth no, Sunday. No, no, So a lot no. of people, you know, I, I know, that, but they're going to ask that question. Are you asking that question? <laughs> well, well, you know, I've, um, I, I can certainly appreciate it. From the busyness of the time of year, uh, having, if you have kids, young kids, uh, it can be always a challenge to keep the kids well behaved, perhaps everyone in line, everyone in sync. And then you come in in the morning, they're already excited and really excited about Christmas and there's so much work to be done. And then you got to come, if you're going to go on Christmas Eve, you come back. Maybe the answer, I think real, really the practical answer is perhaps go on Christmas morning it's very calm. You know, people don't know that. Uh, it's hustle and bustle and busy and barely any seating room. You have to show up an hour or more in advance to get a place to be seated at a Christmas Eve Mass. But you go either Midnight Mass or the Christmas Morning Mass. And you got plenty of seating. Plenty of seat. It's very peaceful. I always took the early... Mass at St. Thomas when we were there. I loved that Mass. Yeah, you did. I was very um, happy for you to have it because we had a true midnight Mass. Yeah, a true midnight Mass. And so... And I don't do well. We would get back you know. 3 a.m., you know, get to bed, and we had the 7.30 yes, Mass. Yes, you had. And I loved those people that came to that. We were we were together every year yes, as the early birders, and it was just beautiful. It worked out really well. I loved well, it. all right. So let's get off of that. Uh Moving away from the practical, you were bringing up, I think, more of Advent in spiritual terms or time of preparation, or maybe you weren't. I don't know what were you, what were you going after. I wasn't going after anything. <laughs> <laughs> I just noticed just that acknowledging the context. I, I have had some people comment yeah. about a previous podcast Uh-oh. that were very grateful that we gave them license 
to prepare for our Lord's coming by decorating early. Oh, really? Yes. Good. I've heard a number of comments on that. And it's probably more typical that we're getting compliments from giving people license. Well, that's true. <laughs> they're not doing so. <laughs> that tell them that they need to rein it in. Yeah. Um, but oh, we no, have had, license, of course, yeah. living in the seminary, we, we don't really have much of an option. So if we're going to be um, engaging in the season and having various uh, persons over and festivities and everything else, we have to begin early. So... Of course, we decorate, decorated everything on the Saturday. Yeah, of it looks beautiful. First Sunday of I mean, it's a, very well done. It's it's very festive. It it's a it's a decorating that matches the style uh, of the seminary. So it's very fitting. It's very beautiful. It's atmospheric. Well, thank you. It's lovely. Um, Speaking uh, of which, we do have an open house on December sixteenth. From let's see, it's I think it's from two to five. December sixteenth. Yeah, so so I don't know that this would even air. We're hoping that it airs before then. It probably won't, but we'll try it. Um, but because we're getting close to that day, what but, is it? It's a thirteenth. But the idea is that yeah. people can come and not just see that the seminary one is decked out for the celebrations, but also to come and see our new polytic. Let oh, me explain what that is. Beautiful. So for five years, we've had a wonderful artisan and her brother working on a sacred piece of art that is adorning currently our chapel and now will be moved in the future to the major chapel. But it's an artwork of 14th century Sienese painting, egg tempera painting on gold. Really quite stunning, not something that has been done in any recent future or recent history. And it's taken five years to accomplish. So it's a main panel with Our Lady and the Christ Child, uh, panels of St. Catherine of Siena, St. Mary Magdalene, St. John the Baptist, and of course, St. Joseph. It sits upon uh, a predella with two other paintings, one of the uh, Epiphany and the Three Kings, and then one of the Assumption of Our Lady. So I would uh, just invite all of you, either on that day or another day to come, and uh, and come pay, uh, a, pay us a visit and, and behold what I think is the most stunning piece of art that's great, certainly our diocese, um, in the last many years, but uh, anywhere that I've been. Truly, truly beautiful. In fact, in the center panel, you have Our our Lady mm-hmm. holding Our Lord as a child. Good time to come. Yep. And I, I did notice that you're, aren't you in there? Aren't you being, <laughs> is, is that your face that I see in the palm of Our Lord's hand? I mean, isn't that what that is? is it, That's a bird. Those are your legs. That's Definitely. A bird. I recognize those legs anywhere. Those little bird legs. <laughs> yeah, so there's an old tradition in medieval art where the baby Jesus, well, first of all, in that style of art, baby Jesus does not look like a baby. Like he does and he doesn't. He's got kind of, he's got a baby body, but a bit of an older man face. Not quite old, no. um, but he's, he's wise. Sort of cherubic old. He's cherubic and he's knowing. And the idea behind that, of course, is that he's representing the three ages of man. He encompasses them all, our infancy, our adulthood, um, and the capacity to give his life over in death. But then he holds this bird. And there's a wonderful statue in the Church of San Agostino in Rome. It's a picture, it's a statue of Our Lady, the Christ Child, and St. Anne. And St. Anne is clearly um, attempting to get the bird that the baby Jesus is holding. And he's holding it away from her as if to say, you can't have this. It's the first time I ever noticed it. Because it represents Represents it. his passion. And the first time I saw it, I'm like, I think they're just playing. It's kind of cute. She, she right. wants what he has and she's tickling him, whatever else. And he's being a child, you know, divine brat and not giving it right, to him kind right. of a thing. Um, but the idea in that Christologically is that it represents his passion. The finch, um, I think it's because the finch took a thorn out of his... Uh, crown of thorns out of his head hmm. during the passion and, and was splattered with Christ's blood. And so that same um, image is on the, the finch's head. Um, but be that as it may, either way, it's the sign of his passion. So in this particular case, what we designed is that our Lord is taking our lady's hand who cannot take the passion from him, can't take over the passion, but she can participate in it. So he's grabbing her hand and kind of leading her hand to the passion to us to hold it with him. Hmm. So very beautiful. I thought it was you. I know, I know, you know I know. Your little self in the palm <laughs> of his hand, with your dangly little well, there's all kinds chicken of... legs. 
<laughs> oh, jealousy. It even oh. makes its way into Advent. Nope. Um, nope. nope. So, well, at least now I can appreciate the Finch. Let's talk a little bit about preparation. Yes. We are in the season of Advent. We've got to assist people at some point to prepare, et cetera, mm. for our blessed Lord. And when we say that, I think part of the rub sometimes is that, wait a minute, what actually changes? You're saying prepare, but I'm going to go to Mass the first Sunday of Advent. It's the same Lord that's coming on the first Sunday of Advent as on Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. What am I preparing for? The same thing happens every week. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference? So I thought we would leave that up to Father Winslow to handle for us. What am I saying? Theologically. (laughs) What are we preparing for? Yeah, in the sense that... Well, there's a triple vision, right? You have, you know, Advent is orienting oneself toward the eternal horizon. So the future event of the second coming of Christ. And so as as a season that is yet to be fulfilled, it is a season of preparation toward the ultimate fulfillment of the kingdom of God being fully manifest and the consummation of all of history. So that's toward which we're moving. But of course, all of this uh, becomes known to us because of the first incarnation. So you have our Lord conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and becomes man. And that's the feast day that we're celebrating at Christmas. So we're looking backward at the time in which God became in flesh, became incarnate, and we're looking forward to a time in which he'll return and to be the summation and consummation of all of history. And then, of course, you have his presence with us now that perdures until that time, And we see it most profoundly in the celebration of the Holy Eucharist, at the celebration of Mass. We see his incarnate presence under the appearances of bread and wine. And so we have this triple vision, really. Uh, And so we want to always prepare to celebrate the Lord, uh, particularly his past coming as as a type of commemoration of that grand event in all of history, but also as it perdures and endures to this day through the Holy Eucharist, an extension of the Incarnation that remains with us today and is leading us toward that final consummation of all of history when we will have bodily resurrections and be with him in that eternal kingdom. So Hmm. that's what it is that we're preparing for, uh, a past event, a present event, and a future event all at once. So, you know, oftentimes in the churches artwork when you have scenes of the Annunciation which of course is March 25th because nine months later is December 25th right those two go together as the nine months of our Lord in the womb of our Blessed Mother in fact you genuflect on the feast day that's right so that's if you if you've ever gone to the daily mass and it's uh, March 25th you'll say the creed Mm -hmm. and you'll genuflect at the mention of the incarnation was it I can't remember the new translation I always have to read it was incarnate of the Virgin incarnate Mary. Incarnate of the Virgin Mary. And you would yeah, genuflect. Amen. And you'll do the same thing at Christmas Day. Yeah. So the two times a year you you genuflect. So the the 25th, recognizing the nine months prior, antecedent of the conception mm-hmm. of our Lord in the Virgin Mary's womb, and then on yeah. the birth. But when you see her in the Annunciation, and probably one of the most depicted scenes of, of Our Lady's life with our Lord, you know, she's oftentimes reading a book, and she's oftentimes, that is to say, the scriptures, and oftentimes looking at Isaiah 7.14. She's definitely not reading canon law. She's not reading, uh, well, she she doesn't. And she, she's, she's probably a, not reading well, because the she's a believer. <laughs> <laughs> she has faith. <laughs> In case you didn't know, Winston Winslow is a canon lawyer, which I joke around. And Father here is a Thomist I, slash I, I, I study moralist. He, he studies canon law. Um <laughs> But we need him because he keeps the trains on time. And it's as I tell everybody, time. you need a good moral theologian to teach you all the loopholes. <laughs> I don't seem to give you Oh, any they loopholes. find a way around it. I give you no loopholes. Uh, you don't give me them. Um, I don't pay you enough. So if she's reading 714, she too is engaged in some kind of preparation, right? Because, of course, unlike us, she's waiting for the first coming. And in that case, the first coming of the Messiah, who is going to be born of a virgin. At the same time, just because that's the case, doesn't necessarily know that the one to come is going to be the Son of God. 
because of course God hadn't revealed yet that he had a son. Um, there might be some antecedent hints and some foreshadowing in the Old Testament, but strictly speaking, that Christmas is also a revelation, hence Epiphany being one of the greatest feasts of the season, a manifestation that God has a son. We didn't know that before uh, the incarnation, before actually that was revealed to the to Our Lady at the Annunciation. And so she's she's also in that period of waiting for something that she doesn't know is coming necessarily. Mm. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, and certainly that knowledge will be matured and clarified when he he speaks and starts teaching us about the nature of God in his discourses that pertain to the Father and the Spirit and Himself, and that's where we start to, to we we get the Trinitarian theology right in, in divine revelation. So we have a more concretized expression of who it is that He is, and that that He is the eternal Son of the eternal Father in union with the Holy Spirit. So, you, well, I'm not suggesting the Mary did you know song. <laughs> which is heretical, right? I mean, the idea is that she did know, but yeah. she didn't know before necessarily. No, 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 I know what you Gabriel mean. Gabriel came. But yeah, to, to truly understand, say, okay, I have, I've conceived by the Holy Spirit. That, all right, you have a sense. Yeah, that this is God's this is, work. This is God's work. This is a divinity, right? Yeah. The, the Holy Spirit does not conceive anything less than the divine. That's right. Yeah, so that's you know that that's, that's what's going point. to happen. But yeah, to be able to say, but that's, that's in relation as a son to the Father and the Spirit, like to start to formulate those relationships and yeah. articulate them. They really, he, he will be the one to, to hone, to hone further definition of those relationships. But it is a great question as what can she deduce based upon the words of the angel and what she's experiencing happening to her and when she holds the child. And for that matter, what the angels say in the fields to the shepherds. Mm-hmm. And then the reference to Emmanuel, God is with us. Right, right. I mean, what are those things that can be good? I've always marveled how we have these saints in history that demonstrate extraordinary gifts, insights, wisdom, knowledge, prophecy, as well as, of course, you know, profound works that are often written uh, that we read over and over and over again because of their clarity and insight. But then when people talk about what Mary knew. Somehow she's dumb as a stump. You know, know. she doesn't have the knowledge. Even though she's immaculate conceived, she's full of grace. Yes. It's like, you know. (laughs) As a perfect intellect that's not fallen. All of the insights, all of the gifts that every saint ever had. I'm Padre Pio, for heaven's sake, who had these mystical phenomena. Take all of them, add them together, and they're still going to be less than what she possessed. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So I find it extremely difficult for people to propose with a straight face that somehow she was just this maiden girl who was clueless. Exactly. No, I think that just the opposite uh, is my contention is that you know she's she's unfallen. She's filled with grace, which means she has the gifts par excellence mm-hmm. of understanding of counsel, original wisdom, justice, right? Everything. And all of a sudden, these words come to her from the angel Gabriel, words that we're going to repeat forever. Mm -hmm. Like, it's true when she says, all generations are going to call me blessed. What do we say? Everyone who says the Hail Mary, how many times a day? Mm -hmm. Blessed are you among women? Perpetually, yeah. We're consistently repeating that. Hail Mary. And I would say that at that moment, everything for her lights up. She realizes exactly what what she was made for, number one. Um, But also what it meant when Isaiah was talking about that and what mm-hmm. what God is actually going to do, not just some Messiah, as we've heard a thousand times, that was simply political, but something incredibly more. The one's going to save us from our sin, but also it happens to be the Son of God, the only one who can actually repair that which was made with him, through him, and for him. And the prior moment, though, is the one I'm interested in, only because if she's preparing for something by the reading of scripture, by by her own life, by her prayer time, by by inspecting, uh, as it were, all the signs that God had given to her. And she could not have, and no one could prepare necessarily to be the mother of God. I mean, God prepared her by her method conception and by his grace. And yet, just knowing what is going to happen doesn't happen, I, I can't imagine, until Gabriel says something. And so the reason I'm, I'm bringing that up, maybe just my own musings, is that I... I think sometimes I, 
I'm preparing for something I don't know. That's going to be larger than mm-hmm. the thing that I'm expecting because this particular season is all about everyone wanting like the perfect Christmas, you know, or the 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 the, the perfect scene or mm-hmm. the per- perfect family visit or whatever the thing is to to nail your Christmas dismount. <laughs> right, I'm gonna <laughs> so land it. I landed that. Right, <laughs> and the hard part is there are too many players or too many actors. Yeah, it's not like you going off the vault. It's like you and twenty others are going off the vault together. Yeah. Good luck and get everyone to land land that dismount together. Yeah. And so maybe we need to consider our preparations as being a bit more grand than all the social lubrication happened and everyone got along. Let's just smile at each other as we launch off this (laughs) this pummel horse. (laughs) We we pray we don't kill each other on the way down and (laughs) and can have a little sense of humor about us. You know, I was thinking about this earlier today, I think it was, that God became man, this incredible act of love while we were fallen. And it seems like a simple statement, but practically speaking, I'm not sure how well we, the faithful, absorb that reality because so often we think that we merit his love. So often we think that we have to deserve it. Mm-hmm. But he, we deserved nothing. In fact, we got what we deserved, right? The consequence of original sin, which is death and no no access to eternal life in heaven. So we got what we deserved. <laughs> That's justice. <laughs> yeah. Um, but his becoming man, this is the, the good shepherd who's going after the lost sheep of the human family. That's the act of love. Yeah. And that precedes our sense, or rather, um, our response, right? That, that is that to which we, yeah. we are responding. And to understand that that love is not contingent upon our perfection. Yeah, yeah, that's... Uh, St. Thomas has a great line in his discussion about charity in which which he considers charity as a kind of friendship between man and God. And since friendship requires a kind of mutual benevolence, and take us, for example, I'm always benevolent to you, but that's, no, you're not, not. that's not reciprocated. Whoa, 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 so, whoa. So, There's so many things wrong with that sentence. <laughs> what happens ultimately is that I get the merit of being oh. friends to him, but I don't get All the right, For the sake reciprocal... of the point, we are going to concede to whatever stupidity... <laughs> Of an analogy or an example you're going to Well, offer. because, see, Tom is asking the question, if this is the definition of friendship, which is mutually known, benevolence, will and good together. It's got to be mutually known, and it's got to be beneficent. You actually have to do something about which you will. You will good to another, but you got to do something for that. Once again, the lack of disparity between myself <laughs> and Wednesday. You have to have concord, uh-huh. right, which is a kind of... Um, you, you think the same thing about the highest things. Your hearts mm-hmm. are kind of concorde, right? They almost like chords on a piano. They, with. They're with together, mm-hmm. with the heart. Um, and then there's a kind of joy in the shared life that you have, depending on what that kind of shared life is. What a delight. Um, a delight in it. And so if that's the definition of a friendship, the question arises that, that how can Christ have charity for us? Because we, we're not friends, we're enemies. Right. And... Thomas answers very simply from the scriptures. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He says that he willed the good to us such that would allow us to will the good to him. Mm. His doing that, his becoming man and dying, is what makes of us capable of friendship, without which we couldn't be friends. It's true. But we didn't merit that. But it's it's, it's a very act that allows us to be capable of actually doing that in return. Precisely. But to really wrap your head around that notion that he loves not contingent upon our perfection, but rather in spite of our lack of perfection. Yeah. And then, as you say, provides a means by which we are able then to love back. Yeah, our lack of response is our inability to actually participate in that. But to we really don't change him. But I think that, you know, without putting it all together, but to stop at that one moment and to reflect upon that, that his love is so great toward me, toward you, toward all of us, without 
being contingent upon me meriting a thing or me being perfect. Um, well, you made me stop at that point when you said you. <laughs> that really did boggle my mind. But I mean, how many how many times? Like, all right. So in, in priestly life, in ministry, we have opportunities to work with people. But how often are people stopped in their tracks? They're looking backward upon their lives, and they have regret. Yeah. And they feel the weight of it, and they feel defined by it. And when they say they don't, they don't feel as though God can truly love them or that they can really move forward. There's this fight with despair. Actually, there's a lack of a fight with despair. You're actually conceding to it. Yeah. It becomes so difficult to really own the fact that in spite of your faults, that God loved you first. Yep. And it's a very hard truth to wrap your head around because we are so accustomed, especially as adults, thinking that we need to deserve it. Yeah. And then we put ourselves into an impossible position because we fundamentally think that we need to deserve it. So therefore we say, well, what can I do to deserve it? Well, you can't do anything to deserve it. Well, I'm in a bit of a, I'm in a, a bit of an infinity loop of despair, right? I'm never going to come out of this because I can't. Whereas, you can take a hold of your present and your future. You can respond to this grace to bring yourself, as you say, in concordance with this divine life. You can move in that direction, but you have to fundamentally believe yeah. that he wants you to and that he still wants you. Yeah, this is the old adage of, I mean, so many, but Mother Teresa said it very simply, you know, that... We love things because they're good, right? Yeah. And God's love makes us good. Yeah. It doesn't, we don't. It's not, it it's not, it's not a precondition. He doesn't love us because we're good. Yeah. It's the same thing with beauty. You know, St. Thomas says beauty is a condition of one of the requisites of love. <clears throat> that it's the kind of thing that, that gets love going. Because mm. it's a, I won't go into a beauty thing right now, but it's, it's something that just, it, the, the mind takes pleasure in because it's a kind of ontological perfection and something that's perfect that someone sees mm -hmm. and it begins that process of seeing it as a good and mm -hmm. loving it and that's but the adage is different with God because he doesn't begin to love us because we're beautiful but we're beautiful because he chooses to love us yeah um, and then there's the, but there is a corollary to that deserving that I find very satisfying as well because I, I sit on that first point a lot. I need to. Because <laughs> yeah. of my own knowledge of my life, my sinfulness, whatever. Um, and I, I love the fact. I, I just I reveled. I, I'm happy about the fact that, that I can't change his mind about me. In the sense that right. he, because he loves me. But there's the corollary that I find very satisfying and delightful. Is that I can respond. And that's that whole notion of merit. Maybe we should have a different talk. You know, sure. discussion about just what is merit. Because um, it's not deserving as love, not the same thing as deserving mm -hmm. as love, but there is real merit because he wants to be able to say to us at the end of our lives, well done. You can't say that unless there's some genuine merit involved, where because of his grace and because of his power, we can actually do something to which he can say, good job. I agree. And, and I think that's uh, worth another time slot where we discuss it further. That said... We've seen people stuck yeah. where they won't proceed yeah. because they can't get out of the loop yeah. uh, thinking that they have to do something to merit moving forward. Sure. And that's been done by our Lord. I mean, that's been yeah. done by God. Uh, we have, we to, have to accept that. We have to move forward. And it's hard because when we look back in our lives, I mean, we want to take a big old eraser and erase away. But the truth is we can do something better than our race. Mm. We can change. Yeah. Yeah. He can make all things new. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, good. Well, before we go, you were commenting on what I think is a legitimate option for Christmas trees, uh -oh. which is the long needle pine. Lo well. I am accepting of all different kinds of trees. And so... It's the shape of a football. <laughs> 
I mean, this thing tapers on the bottom and it tapers on the top. It looks like a pineapple. It Yes. You have a green, fuzzy pineapple. I love it. Um, so we have lots of different trees this summer. It's large for a pineapple, small for a tree. Yeah. And so I have one of the trees we have. I just I fell in love with it. Was We have wonderful... Uh, Tree man who gets us all our trees and we go pick them out and he's a wonderful. Can you take Christian this off man. of someone's front lawn? I mean, it looks and like a so bush. So this thing I just found like, it's not quite the Charlie Brown Christmas tree. No, it's it a has lot better than that. Too um, much volume for that. But I love it. So it, it's it's those of you who chose the tree that is not perfect. Um, thank you. So I'm like this ugly duckling <laughs> behind me. <laughs> I actually have a beautiful, full, almost. Perfectly shaped, truly, tree. It's exquisite. I'm going to show you a picture. However, it's a type of tree I've never had before. It's not the normal pine that you get or that you see. It's fuller, but not long needled like this mm. thing. So I get it home. I put it up. And I'm realizing this doesn't smell the same way. It doesn't smell better. I can tell you that. I just remember. That, I'm sorry. What's that? I just remember when we had that tree up for so long at St. Thomas. It's, oh my gosh! It's it started so rotten. Rot- so we kept spraying we it with like it with- evergreen spray. Well, I'm back to that. <laughs> <laughs> so I got those evergreen sticks and put them in there. I've got the um, you know the, the the vaporizing scents of of green of evergreen and like the things you used to hang from your, your yes, mirror. <laughs> it's working. It's working. It's a it's a full on approach of pine, but I have to say I had to sac- for the physical beauty. I had to sacrifice uh. the scent. Now I'm going to see how it goes with my my synthetic scents. Uh, so far, it's going so it's going fairly well. But when I first got it, I I, I thought to myself, did I make a mistake? Did I sacrifice mm. the physical beauty? Did I sacrifice did the, the scent smell? for the physical beauty? Yeah. But I, to be fair, I didn't know that was my proposition before I got into the house. It's only when I got into the house I realized that I sniff your tree. I had to sacrifice something. Yeah, you never sniffed your tree. Well, no, who does that? I do. You're ridiculous. <laughs> you do not walk around like lifting up a tree. No, because because the whole tree lot is filled with glorious scents. It's just that I know they all it's, smell. it's in the air now. For those of you, and we're gonna let you go, but for those of you who are handicapped emotionally and whose wills are bent. And whose minds are darkened and have a fake tree. Oh my! There's still time to make confession there is. before Christmas. I'm going to leave it right there. It's a cold repentance. <laughs> At least get a real wreath for the door or something. <laughs> Just some evergreen inside. Something. That. Let's get some of the outside inside. But uh, it, it's hard to vacuum. You know, I, I was having some vacuuming issues. That, you know. In any event. All right. God well, bless you all. Have a blessed preparation of Advent. God bless now. Makes me wanna scream from rooftop to the screen. Thanks for listening to this episode of From the Rooftop. For updates about new episodes, special guests, and exclusive deals for From the Rooftop listeners, sign up at rooftoppodcast.com and remember for more great ways to deepen your faith check out all the spiritual resources available at tanbooks.com and we'll see you again next time from the rooftop rooftop